So, today in this session, uh, we are going to discuss about the evaporators. You see that evaporation means concentrating a solution upon vaporizing the solvent. So, we are increasing the concentration of the solute and we are providing thermal energy to the system, we are increasing the temperature and uh, close to that or uh, above and over this boiling point. So, what will happen? A part of the solute or solvent will evaporate and eventually the concentration of the solute will increase. So, it is a kind of separation and purification of course. However, we discuss this entire process of evaporation uh, in the subject of heat transfer and not in mass transfer, right. The reason is uh, in distillation, so pre more precisely if I uh, just point down that the question reduces to what is the difference between evaporation and distillation. You see distillation is also a vap partial vaporization, right. And we are enriching this vapor phase in terms of high boiling component whereas, the liquid phase is being enriched in terms of low boiling component or in low boiling component. And the in evaporation the same thing is happening in the vapor phase, the vapor phase is rich in solvent whereas, the solution or the liquid phase is enriched in terms of solute. So, what is the specific difference? The difference is we have to understand a term relative volatility, right. So, relative volatility indicates that relative uh, if, if we consider a binary system A and B, right, we are vaporizing it. So, relative volatility alpha A B as you know that this is defined as Y A by X A divided by Y B by X B right, where y and x, y is the mole fraction in vapor phase, whereas x is the same mole fraction in liquid phase, right. So, if A is high boiling component which indicates that A has got lower boiling point. So, definitely we can understand that in distillation alpha A B is greater than 1, right, much greater than 1, maybe 2, 3, etcetera. So, in evaporation what is the value of alpha A B? In evaporation we have to note that alpha A B tends to infinity, right. What is the reason? The reason is here the what are the conventional solution we actually treat in evaporators. Like it may be the typical example is a sugar cane juice, right or uh, this ammonium sulphate or sodium hydroxide we are concentrating. Now, think of sodium hydroxide aqueous solution. So, we have A is water, B is sodium hydroxide. So, the volatility of water is basically much much higher or practically infinite compared to or relative to that of sodium hydroxide. So, essentially the relative volatility goes to infinity and there is no mass transfer or interface mass transfer perspective associated to evaporation. It is entirely driven by thermal energy, we give thermal energy one of the component gets vaporizing or one of the components is actually vaporized, right, leaving the other component in the liquid phase. So, the vapor phase is only containing A, no B, whereas the liquid phase contains both A and B. So, that is the precise difference of evaporation with distillation and that is why evaporation these are in this entire chapter of evaporator and evaporations we deal in heat transfer. <coughs> so, you see the typical example of industrial evaporations 
that as I mentioned that we have we can concentrate this sugar cane juice uh, using evaporator we can concentrate this ammonium sulfate solution in fertilizer industry right ammonium sulfate solution we have to concentrate in fertilizer industry we, we have to concentrate the sodium hydroxide solution uh, so and additionally in uh, this pulp and paper uh, this setups or industries we have the craft black liquor which is to be concentrated so these are the typical examples of evaporation technique what is being used in process industry now next we have to understand the basic uh, this design and the classification of different types of evaporators and after that we will go for the exact design procedure so you see that industrial evaporators they may be one screw evaporator or circulation evaporator right one screw evaporators the solution just passes once through the tubes of this evaporator there is no circulation right specifically this type of evaporators are suitable for uh, this heat sensitive material okay so what are they this falling film rising film agitated surface and circulation evaporator you see there are also two classification where this thermal energy induced density difference if I actually use it as a driving force in this evaporator that becomes natural circulation where the velocity of the liquid through the tubes definitely it is low so it is natural circulation evaporator and the second one is definitely where we are using the motive device for this liquid circulation that is pump so this is called the force circulation evaporator so in this natural circulation generally the velocity is kept at around uh, 1 to 4 feet per second that is the velocity of liquid through the tube and here in force circulation it is 16 to 20 feet per second so in natural circulation you again see we have four different category the first one is nowadays obsolete that is horizontal tube the second one is calandria or short tube vertical evaporators calandria or short tube vertical evaporator the second next the third one is basket type evaporator very similar to short tube we'll discuss that and last one is called long tube vertical evaporator ltv right so horizontal tube calandria or stv basket type evaporator or long tube vertical evaporator whereas in the force circulation group we have external horizontal heating element next internal vertical heating element
and next is external vertical heating element. This is a broad classification of four circulation evaporators. Right. So, in this entire classification, we will definitely discuss calandria, basket type, LTV, and some this this is mostly very similar. There is one heating element under high pressure, which where in the upstream of this heating element we have the pump, and such that there is no vaporization inside this heating element means here it is a heat exchanger which is which will be in the liquid phase, the circulating liquid, there will be no vaporization. And next, its pressure will be reduced to throttling and it will be flashed into a drum, right? Where the liquid and vapor phases will separate out. So, we will discuss this external horizontal heating element type for circulation evaporator. Additionally, we will also discuss falling film and agitated surface. So, you see that short tube vertical evaporator here, uh, this sorry, this in the horizontal tube we have a vessel and through which we have horizontal steam tubes, right, which is uh, basically carrying steam, saturated steam, okay. And you must note that for all heat transfer purpose, we must use saturated steam up to a pressure of 3, 4, 5 atmosphere. But for evaporators and for other heat transfer purposes, its maximum pressure is generally restricted to 3 atmospheres. Uh, 3 atmosphere. So, it is a kind of 3 atmosphere saturated steam at 3 atmosphere. Why we limit it to 3 atmosphere? Because the reason that if we go on increasing the pressure, uh, the tube thickness is to be increased in order to have this enough mechanical strength to withstand the high pressure, right. And whenever you are increasing this tube thickness, you are actually increasing the heat transfer resistance. So, that is why it is an optimum thumb rule that we should limit ourselves within a pressure of 3 atmosphere in evaporators, okay. Now, the point is in horizontal tube as the steam flows through this <coughs> horizontal tubes, there will be inevitable condensation of the steam and there will be liquid slug which may clog the entire tube, right. So, that is why this type of evaporators which was a kind of primitive design nowadays it is obsolete. So, we will next discuss the calandria short tube vertical evaporators. So, you see that uh, what is a calandria? Calandria is basically the horizontal tube uh, mounted in a shell and in the shell side we delivered this or the cell side which is called the steam chest alternatively, we deliver the saturated steam. The entire assembly of this tube and shell, right, that is called calandria. So, that is why this is, uh, you see the structure is something like this, this is a tube sheet. We have two tube sheets, I am drawing a rough view. So, here these are flanged, that is the shell. We have the tubes like this, so these are the tube and centrally we have a large cylindrical section which is called down cover and that is kept to actually close this circulation loop, okay. The circulation in order to retain the circulation through this tube because of vaporization there will be an upward flow of the liquid and it, it will release the vapor somewhere here at this free liquid surface and then it will circulate back. Now at the bottom you see we have either a disc section or a conical section and this is the outlet line. There will be a drain line for condensate 
where we have a special type of valve which is fitted with a special type of valve and that will allow only the release of condensate but not of steam right now steam will be delivered through this nozzle so that is saturated steam its pressure should be less than 3 atmosphere right there will be additionally a vent line so this is the vent line so these are the tubes shell or the steam chest right and this is the down cover or down tech and here we have the evaporator drum right at the top again it is plunged to a dish head which is fitted with the line of vapor and the feed inlet will be somewhere above and over this calandria so this is the evaporator drum <clears throat> so you see what happens will charge the feed and before the startup will ensure that the entire calandria is within the liquid right so there is some allowance or some level this clearance will be around one or one and half feet right now the tubes what we use is diameter id is around 2 to 3 inch and length will be 1 to 2 meter ok and that is why it is it has got a large cross sectional area but the height uh, the headroom required is low relative to other devices like long tube vertical evaporator ok now <coughs> once we charge saturated steam there will be heating of the liquid inside the tube right so as the liquid is being heated up definitely there will be it is a kind of an, and there will be natural density gradient so the liquid start moving in the upward direction right which is loaded with all these vapors and all vapor slugs vapor bubbles etc so the liquid will, the vapor will be released here at the top and the liquid will circulate back through this down comer or the down tech right its cross sectional area of this down comer will be 50 to 100 percent of the total tube cross sectional area 50 to 100 percent of the total cross sectional area of the tubes right so this will allow this natural circulation and as i have mentioned its speed of the circulation will be around 1 to 4 feet per second right and this type of uh, this short tube vertical or calandria type evaporator we can use it for concentrating sugarcane however this is not recommended for crystallizing or scale forming feed right like it may be craft black liquor which has got lot of deposits right when it is heated there will be scaling so for this type of feed generally we do not recommend calandria however we can partially manage this scale formation and we can increase the velocity right upon providing a propeller here or centrally here 
So this is this whenever we are attaching a propeller, it's called this it's specific design, right? And it's referred as propeller fitted calandria. Calandria evaporator. So this is an additional uh, divide which you insert here to manage this scale formation but additionally it increases this operating and capital cost both right. So that is about that is the brief uh, discussion we have about these uh, short tube vertical evaporators. So what are the specific advantages? So it has got a very small headroom right. So you see okay so it has got a low headroom additionally the disadvantage is generally its cross section is large it's a short uh, vertical but large diameter vertical vessel right so that's the problem and generally it is not recommended not useful for scale forming liquid right now if it is a scale forming liquid if I have fitted maybe some propeller or I have managed these surfaces we have modified the surfaces and all but it requires regular cleaning of the tubes then the calandria is not suitable because then we have to open the hatch right and or through the manhole some lever or the working personnel will be we have to go inside and with the brush inserting the brush he has to clean the tubes. However, if this is the design will be designed we can modify a bit if I can remove the entire basket the basket itself the steam chest and the tubes if, if itself is easily detachable. Now see how we can do that and that is typically called the basket type evaporator. Right, I am not drawing the entire uh, this evaporator but simply the part which is different from the calandria, right. And here the design, the otherwise the design, the flow, etc., it is very similar to that of calandria. Here we have the basket, right. We have the tubes here through which the liquid will move upward and in the basket which are steam and this basket is flanged and bolted to the evaporator drum right. And from here we have the conical bottom and often there is a deflector plate fitted covering the cross section of this basket right in order to prevent entrainment. You see what is entrainment? When a vapor bubble bursts at the surface, there is a vigorous boiling. So, vapor bubble when it bursts at the surface, it actually projects a lot of liquid droplets here, right. So, liquid droplets, we arrange this height. If we go for no other accessory, simply we will rely on the height such that after some point it will move back, right. So, that height is called transport disengagement height and based on that we design the height of this evaporator drum. There are empirical uh, this graph available to calculate this transport disengagement height available in any standard design book. But what happens that increases the headroom. So if I want to keep the moderate headroom we have to use entrainment separators right and we will discuss that that there are two types of entrainment separator one is internal to that evaporator called demister which is a thick pad of wear and another one is a helical baffle fitted uh, just like 
a kind of cyclone like equipment and it's called catch all right so we'll discuss these entrainment separators uh, this later but here it's a kind of deflector plate right it's not a typical entrainment separator it's a kind of deflector plate where the liquid entrain liquid will heat right and will deflect back now what happens here we are delivering the steam so it is definitely the saturated steam so when it it will heat up the liquid the liquid because of density gradient and vaporization will move upward and will fall back through this annular space between the basket and the vessel right and again it will start moving up through the tube once it releases the vapor at the top so as it is bolted you can have additional flanges here flange and bolt assemblies right so just you uh, unlock the bolt joints and remove the entire basket that can be done right so externally you can actually clean these tubes so otherwise the except this basket and removable tube type assembly the structure is very similar to the short tube vertical evaporator so so next we'll go for discussing another special type of evaporator that's long tube vertical and with a simple modification right with a simple modification we can convert it to the rising film evaporator as well that is one stroke right where a short tube uh, sorry long tube vertical is a circulation evaporator and this uh rising film is a one stroke evaporator right with a simple modification we can change a uh, long tube vertical to the rising film type so what is a long tube vertical evaporator see here we have a small section because it uses tubes of height 5 to 10 meter and that's why it is referred as long tube vertical evaporator so that's the tube sheet here we have the flange and this bottom right the point is what is the structural difference feed is delivered at the bottom right and here we have another tube sheet then again the vessel and there is definitely a deflector plate and we have the tubes like this right so from the top we have the vapor outlet so this is the vapor outlet deflector plate tubes and we supply steam here and we withdraw the condensate here and the condensate line of course it's fitted with a steam trap right so we have the vent line to vent sorry in this region we cannot show okay anyway 
So we have the vent line, right? And you see what will happen. You will deliver the feed, and the feed, the height of the feed before startup or height of the or liquid level in this tubes will be around one meter, whereas the total height of the tubes will be 5 to 10 meter, 1 to 2 inch will be the diameter of the tubes. <coughs> now as we deliver the steam here, the liquid will start boiling, right, and in this relation we must understand the different regions of flow boiling. Right, pool boiling we have discussed this Nokiyama's plot and Farber's chorus plot and all, right, which is a log log plot of heat transfer coefficient and excess temperature, but that was pool boiling. Here, let us have a basic region or uh, this different regimes of this flow boiling. What is that? See, initially when we charge the liquid. The first region, there will be some vapors and all that subcooled boiling. Right. Next, we have larger vapor bubbles occupying a large part of the volume, that is the bubbly flow region. Next, these vapor bubbles will coalesce to form large slugs and that region is called slug flow. After that the slug will coalesce further and actually will occupy the entire central part of this tube and the liquid will be restricted in the form of film which will creep or rise because of this shear with this vapor a central core of the vapor and that region is called annular flow. And after that we have the alternatively the liquid droplets here we should actually represent it in the form of white dot right here it is still smaller the liquid will be converting into a droplet there is no further liquid film and that region is called mist flow. Right. So, here this subcooled boiling then bubbly flow, slug flow everything will happen the pool height will increase and finally it will entirely convert into mist flow or annular flow region. Intermediately there will be some annular flow and after that entirely it will be mist. Right. So, there will be lot of liquid droplets being entrained by this flow of vapor and here once it is vaporized its volume increases. So, it will acquire tremendous velocity in this region upper region of the tube. So, the heat transfer coefficient here because of this high velocity of vapor uh, will be much higher compared to this part right. In the lower half the heat transfer coefficient definitely the overall heat transfer coefficient is large right through the average heat transfer coefficient over the entire tube. However, over this region the heat transfer coefficient will further increase and it is to some extent much larger than this region and that is because that when the liquid is getting converted into vapor that is a mist basically right and it is moving up with uh, through the upward direction with a very high velocity because the liquid volume. Uh, just uh, just think of water, the water vapor has got 1000, uh, 100 times higher volume than that of liquid. So, essentially as the volume increases the mass flow here and here remains same. So, evidently the volume flow as it tremendously increases, so velocity will increase in this region. So, this mist will be <coughs> heating this plate, deflector plate and will be forming a pool of liquid here, right. Now you see from the top if I withdraw the liquid 
right the concentrated liquor it becomes a typical rising film evaporator right it's not a long tube vertical however if i simply recirculate back a part of this liquid with a valve definitely then it becomes a long tube vertical evaporator so if you simply remove this bypassing line and operate this or change a bit this operating condition a long tube vertical evaporator essentially becomes a rising film evaporator right so long tube vertical evaporator as as it has got a tremendously high velocity in this tube relative to short tube vertical or basket type these are recommended for scale forming liquids right but definitely the viscosity should not be that high if the viscosity further increases right if the viscosity is pretty high we have to and, and it has got a very high scale forming tendency or crystallizing tendency then we have to switch to force circulation evaporator the natural circulation will no longer be sufficient but still here the velocity will be relatively much higher than that of short tube vertical and that's why we generally recommend this long tube vertical evaporators for uh, this scale forming liquids like this paper uh, craft black liquor now you see uh, <coughs> high heat transfer coefficient it's low cost low liquid hold up liquid hold up is relatively much lower in long tube vertical compared to that of short tube vertical right high heat transfer coefficient low cost low liquid hold up and less flow space required so these are the advantages of long tube vertical evaporator right so definitely the disadvantage is high headroom and definitely it is not very suitable for viscous and highly scale forming materials where we have to switch where entirely basic this natural circulation group members are not uh, recommended we have to switch to force circulation evaporators <coughs> next we will discuss another uh, this wants to uh, evaporator and that is falling film what is a falling film evaporator structurally it looks very similar however we deliver the feed at the top because it is falling film we have to deliver it here the diameter actually we have to increase because the vapor is being released from the bottom and concentrated liquor this is a kind of separated drum so this is the concentrated liquor we have to withdraw so what is the situation here we deliver the feed from the top the deflector plate but this is not a typical deflector plate it actually <coughs> distributes the liquid to the periphery and here the tubes will be protruding through this tube sheet at the top the tubes will be somewhat having the structure like this right and the tubes this end of the tube the top end will be notched ends we'll discuss about it so these are the tubes okay so that's the typical falling film evaporator 
feed the top liquid chamber. Here the liquid will be occurring this much of level and then it overflows. So this is the top liquid chamber and this is a distribution flat. the tubes and we definitely have the steam inlet and vent line and all right and steam condensate fitted with steam trap. So this is the condensate drainage line. So this is called the bottom liquid chamber. So that is the structure of the grass structure of falling film evaporators. Right. Now you see the, as I mentioned that these ends of these tubes, they are notched. So what is that? See if the tube looks like this, so we have notches like this, rectangular notches are drilled at this end of the tubes. Right, why I will explain. And this is the tube sheet and here we have the liquid pool, right. So that is the tube sheet, rectangular notch, and the pool of liquid. So you see that what is the first operational requirement or, or what is the operation rather. So we deliver the feed, feed through this, it will hit this umbrella like distribution plate. So it will accumulate here that we do not directly charge the feed in order to avoid basically heavy wave like wavy surface of this liquid. Why? If it is wavy the thickness actually here of this liquid that will also oscillate. So in order to prevent that and also to prevent direct inflow of the liquid into the tubes without forming a, this annular a film like structure, right. So if, if this liquid directly enters definitely there will be no annular film like structure, it, the liquid from the pool has to overflow into the tube. Then we can all, only have this film, the annular film like structure which and that is why the evaporator is being referred as falling film, right. So the film is to be generated and because of that we use this deflector plate and the thickness of the film should be more or less constant and it should be a kind of circular film, right. So, if I want to ensure the wet, wetting of this entire inner surface, that is why we are drilling this notch because we know in the downstream of the notch, the flow will be like this, right. So from the downstream, the flow will diverge and as it diverges, the entire we have the, means we will be ensured that the entire liquid inner surface will be wetted by the or when that tube inner surface will be wetted by the liquid and forming this annular film, right. So if here in this film thickness should be kept constant and that is why we use this deflector plate such that it will overflow into, overflow into the tubes and uniformly wetting the inner surface of these tubes, right. So what happens you see that as the liquid moving down with occupying the larger part of these tubes, there will be evaporation. 
and the vapor whatever is generated it should be drifted by this film of this liquid in the downward direction so that's the essence so you have to very minutely control this film thickness right upon changing this level and changing the feed flow rate so generally you see that here the film Reynolds number is defined as 4 tau divided by mu oh sorry 4 gamma divided by mu and here the gamma is the mass flow rate per unit perimeter of the tube right so tube Reynolds number it has been shown that one of the nice criteria is that the tube Reynolds number must be greater than 200 for uniform weighting right so the criteria is this Reynolds number should be greater than 200 there are other criteria as well uh, there, there is a direct estimate of this tau minimum tau minimum will be some point uh, one to eight or something let me check a uh, point one to eight mu into s into sigma to the power the exponent is there that is point two right so that is the expression of tau minimum you do not have to remember this but it is just an expression an estimate that this much tau minimum we have to maintain okay otherwise we will not have even we provide this notch and all the reflector plate will not be able to provide this or generate this uniform film so this film it will evaporate right and at the same time you see that it will drag the vapor formed internal to the tube in the downward direction and here the vapor will be released along with liquid droplets entrant liquid droplets here it will be released right so liquid vapor a kind of separation will take place definitely there will be some liquid droplet being entrained in that vapor line so as it moves here we have to feed a liquid vapor separator drum that is a catch-all and again feed it back to this liquid chamber okay so that's the falling film evaporator so falling film evaporators are highly recommended for heat sensitive material which must flow through this evaporator just only once and the typical example it's fruit juice milk so this type of material can be treated in <coughs> falling film evaporator right but it is not suitable for highly viscous heat sensitive material like when the viscosity is above and over 500 cp so for that it is not recommended right for other solutions like ammonium nitrate also this type of falling films are recommended so next to that we have the rising the sorry the agitated surface evaporator so in agitated surface i will not go into the detail but you see agitated surface is also wants to but if it has got its heat sensitive material but at the same time it has got a very high viscosity the viscosity may be greater than 1 lakh cp just like the example is tomato paste tannin different type of enzyme solution then beer malt etc so in that case we have to go for agitated surface here it's a single pipe a deep large pipe we have a jacket where we deliver steam right steam jacket and this type of structure may be sorry So we have a notch here, so we deliver the feed here, right. So from this pool, it will move like this, it will overflow.
and from the bottom uh, whatever we have here we have the vapor line and additionally we have the basket uh, sorry the spinning uh, paddle right so it's a kind of plate like this This is the main shaft and these are the paddles. So this is the paddle, shaft, steam jacket, <coughs> evaporator, drum and all from the bottom we simply take this liquid right, and the steam will move up and will be released from this top vapor line. So that is typically the agitated surface evaporator, however it has got a high capital and operating cost because you have the moving part. So as the paddle moves what will happen, see if you have a highly viscous uh, this vertical film, materials vertical film there will be always a bludging right and there will be high viscosity and the surface tension will basically solidify this bludge liquid. So there is a continuous movement in order to prevent this bludge front. So we have the paddle here, right? It will keep this film thickness below this threshold limit and will not allow overheating or hot spot formation of the specific device, inside the specific device, right? So as a consequence, we will have the smooth evaporation of highly viscous liquids where the density may be or this uh, the viscosity may be as high as 1 lakh centipoise, right. So, so the typical material this feed what we treat in agitated surface tomato paste candies beer malt meat extract tannin extract gelatin water soluble polymers the disadvantage as you can understand it has got a high capital cost and uh, moving internal because of that we have a high operating cost as well so next just we will discuss this four circulation evaporator with external horizontal heating element Right. So, four circulation evaporator with external horizontal heating element. See, I am just drawing a rough overview. This is the evaporator drum. Right. We have a conical bottom. From here, it goes to the pump. and we withdraw the concentrated liquid definitely upon using a valve such that we can use this control flow and we have the feed line. So this is the feed, this is concentrated liquid and from the pump it goes to this heating element. Heating element, you see, it is a typical 1 2 type heat exchanger, right. But basically, here what is given, okay, it is a 2 2 heat exchanger, what is given. There is the, in the shell side there is a partition plate and we have the tubes, we have a partition plate is being extended, right. So we have the steam in and from here condensate out, that is the pump. So that is 2 to external 
horizontal heating element from the top there will be vapor line and from here we simply flash it to the drum right with a deflector plate of course. So, that is the evaporator drum deflector plate and that is to the liquid separator. Right. So, this is typically the four circulation evaporator. Now, why we use four circulation as I mentioned that whenever we are increasing or we have to increase the circulation velocity because it is highly scale forming or crystallizing liquid right. So, then we have to increase the velocity of circulation through the tube such that the enhanced shear is able to scoop up the accumulated crystal on the tube surfaces. So, here that is why four circulation is inevitable right. So, here we are giving the feed, we are drawing the concentrated liquor. So, as we are pressurizing there will be no vaporization internal to the tube, but once it is flashed there will be vaporization. So, it vapor and liquid separates out. So, it is a continuous circulation whatever is happening here right. Now, you see that when we go for vertical heating element, vertical heating element the floor space requirement will be low. However, as we have seen from Nusselt equation particularly for this external HO because steam is charged on the external side is proportional to for vertical it is proportional to length tube length to the power 1.4 and HO horizontal is proportional to 1 by d naught to the power 1 by 4. So, that is why always we should go for horizontal but it should be always external heating element and that increases the floor space. So, mitigate between these two we also switch to uh, external or this four circulation with external vertical heating element where the capital cost is low, but the compact design where the floor space requirement is much much lower only the evaporator drum and inside we have this heating element that is definitely the of high capital cost. So, if the floor space is available this type of structure is recommended for four circulation if floor space is unavailable or it is moderately restrained we should go for four circulation with external vertical heating element. But if we have to go for the highest compact form of design then it should be four circulation with internal vertical heating element we are not going into the discussion of the design. So, that is all about the different types of the evaporator in the next session we will be discussing the evaporator accessories right like this uh, steam jet ejector then steam traps and entrainment separator. Next we will go for discussing the basic uh, terminologies associated to evaporation that is uh, capacity economy, boiling point elevation, how to calculate or how to correct for this hydrostatic head and all ok.